imagine this. You step out from the club, your head still thumping with the rhythms of the dance floor. You've had a great night, and the only reason you're heading home now is so you can catch your flight tomorrow. You pull out your phone to hail a ride, but before you even realize what's happening, a guy on an electric scooter zooms by and snatches your unlocked phone straight out of your hand. You're stunned for a second or two, then start running after him, but realize it's pointless. He's already too far gone for you to have any chance of catching up. You run back in to find your friends. You took a course on privacy back at university, so you know how important it is to act quickly. But the club is full of people, and it takes a while before you locate them, manage to explain over the loud music what just happened, and get to borrow one of their phones so you can log into your accounts and secure them. By then, three minutes have passed, and unfortunately, it's already too late. The thief has both disabled your phone's location services, ensuring it's untraceable, and reset your all-important email account password. Since this serves as your primary digital gateway to almost every other account, being the place where all other password reset requests are sent, you quickly realize you're also locked out of your banking app, your cloud storage, and your social media accounts. Of course, being privacy-minded, you had two-factor authentication set up on several of these, but since that's mostly just a text message with a security code sent directly to your phone, it doesn't help you at all now. From here, things go from bad to worse. The thief, or more likely the larger criminal organization they presumably work for, wastes no time draining your bank accounts using your payment app. They also use the credit cards you have in your digital wallet to make a number of large purchases just under the amount that the banks would automatically recognize as suspicious and put a hold on. By the time you've managed to find the emergency number and get through to your bank to immediately block all your cards and lock everything down, most of the direct financial damage is already done. At this stage, you call the police. It's not a life-or-death emergency, so after an interminably long time in a phone queue, a police officer dutifully listens to you and asks you a number of questions to take down your report. Then, when you're all done, she levels with you. Look, she says, as much as I hate to say it, the reality is that we're unlikely to ever catch the person or people who did this. They're probably operating mostly from some other country, so there just isn't much we can do. I don't want you getting your hopes up unnecessarily. You fall asleep that night with your head spinning. Next day, you awake in a blur, only to realize that the criminals have wasted no time compromising your social media. There's no easy way to get hold of any customer service representative at the social media companies, even the large ones, to prove to them that your phone has been stolen. I mean, they offer some click-through options, but you get the feeling you might need to wait weeks for any meaningful response. So in the meantime, all you can really do is try to warn friends and family that your accounts have all been hacked. But this is like trying to play whack-a-mole with a blindfold on. You don't know it yet, but you'll soon hear stories from old classmates and colleagues and friends who you haven't spoken to for years, receiving either phony messages from somebody pretending to be you asking for money, or phishing messages designed to hack their accounts, or sometimes both at once. And then there's a steady stream of disturbingly offensive content they post publicly in your name. You know things are bad when your parents start getting phone calls from distant, concerned relatives asking if you're actually doing okay, mentally. A few days later, when you think you've weathered and managed to control the worst of it all, you begin to realize the deeper damage. Using your information, somebody has applied for credit cards and payday text message loans and online shopping accounts in your name and bought several items on invoice. As you'll find out months later, the criminals quickly sold your identity on the dark web along with a mortifying collection of personal messages and photos, the sorts of things that were intimately private. In fact, although you'll be reimbursed for several of the illegal purchases, your credit score will suffer for years to come. But again, you don't know that yet. And then, finally, as if all that wasn't enough, comes the nastiest surprise of all. Because you've been doing some of your work during your commute, it turns out you downloaded sensitive work-related information onto your phone, and this has now been accessed and shared by the criminals. Not only does this mean your company has grounds to terminate your position, and very well might do just that, but the breach could even lead to legal repercussions for you personally. Two seconds. That's all it took to snatch your phone and facilitate the complete and systematic destruction of your financial stability, a number of your relationships, your career, and your sense of safety. In other words, because of hacking and identity theft, because the criminals were able to easily bypass your information security settings, your privacy has just been completely and utterly trashed. Now, although this is a fictional example, unfortunately it's still an example based on the real lived experience of millions of people around the world on a regular and ongoing basis. The details obviously differ in each individual case, but three elements of these sorts of cases seem to be relatively common and constant. First, that it takes a huge amount of time and effort to even begin repairing the damage done, like to your credit rating. 
Second, that you're unlikely to ever see justice done to whoever it was that stole your phone and identity. And finally, third, that you feel like your privacy has been grossly violated in a way that can often be quite emotionally destabilizing or even debilitating. Today, we'll be talking about this, the intersection between privacy and information security and how it plays out in practice. In the previous video, I made a point out of just how difficult it is to define the concept of privacy, but I also said that perhaps we don't need an exact definition and can still make progress on privacy-related concerns. Why? Well, at least in this context, for a very simple reason. Basically, because no matter how any philosopher or legal scholar defines privacy, they all agree that personal information is a fundamental and central part of it. So yes, the debate rages on about whether or not the constitutional Supreme Court right to not be subjected to interference in important life decisions, like in Griswold v. Connecticut, is correct or not. But personal information? Everybody agrees on that part. So as long as we stick to just personal information, we can rest assured we're talking about privacy, regardless which definition we happen to be relying on. Now, perhaps you're asking yourself, well, then why didn't we just focus on personal information to begin with and be done with it? Then we wouldn't have needed an entire video lecture on the vagaries of the concept of privacy. True, but unfortunately, it's not that easy. You see, there are a number of privacy-related cases that have little or nothing to do with personal information. Like if the government comes up with a new law that says that the police have the right to install hidden cameras in anybody's home, regardless if they're suspected of a serious crime or not. In this sort of case, it doesn't matter whether your home has a hidden camera in it or whether the police have any personal information about you or not. No, the mere existence of the new law can be seen in and of itself as a threat to your and my and everybody else's privacy privacy. Although, of course, if this is really so depends, again, on how we're actually defining the concept. So yes, the definition of privacy is still a big deal. We're just putting that discussion in brackets for now by focusing on a part of privacy, personal information, that allows us to sidestep and temporarily ignore all those complications. And how do we know that we're only talking about personal information and nothing else? Well, because information security in the context of privacy is really only about keeping personal information safely locked up and away from malicious actors. Okay, but given all the talking I did last time about how difficult it can be to define terms, what about information security? Maybe that's also difficult to find a good definition for. As it turns out, fortunately, it's relatively easy at least compared to the concept of privacy. So basically, the concept of information security is just keeping data from falling into the wrong hands. Okay, some brief clarifications here. First, what is data? Well, data is really any information. Personal information, trade secrets, national security intelligence, metadata, and so on. It's all data. So information security is about keeping data secure. And then, of course, when we talk about privacy and information security, we're only really interested in the personal information part of the data, so that's what we'll stick to for now. All right, how about the wrong hands? Well, in this context, the classic CIA triad can really help. So this is a widespread tendency to define information security as consisting of three subcomponents. One, confidentiality. That is, that the information is only accessible to the right relevant individuals and secret and inaccessible to everybody else. Two, integrity. That is, that the information is authentic, accurate, and reliable. So basically that nobody's tampered with it. And three, availability. That is, that the information is available to those who need it. If any of these conditions fail to hold, then we can say that we don't have security in relation to the information in question. Now, with that out of the way, in this video, I'm going to talk about three levels of privacy-related information security and some of the various risks and threats that they face. And as you'll see in each case, the situation is arguably worse than you probably suspect. Then, in the next video, we'll talk about various practical solutions to mitigate these risks and threats. In other words, this video will be a bit of a downer since it's going to focus on all the problems before we then turn in the next one to instead focus on some of the ways we try to tackle those problems. Anyway, off we go. Our first level of privacy-related information security is going to focus on the individual. Now, in the phone snatching example I began with, one prominent reason why the criminal exploits actually worked was because the hypothetical person had a huge chunk of their life easily accessible from within their mobile phone. And I'm willing to wager that this is largely the same for most of us. That is, 
it's really convenient to put so much of our lives and ourselves into our phones. In fact, for almost all of us today, our phones replace dozens of different items we'd have been forced to buy separately in the past. A landline telephone, an address book, an alarm clock, a calculator, a calendar, a mailbox, a camera, a GPS, a TV and radio, a Walkman, a dictaphone, a computer, our car keys, our commuter tickets, our books and music albums, our credit cards, and so on and so forth. So sticking all these into our smartphones makes both for less physical stuff in our home in our pockets, as well as having a lot more with us whenever we're on the go. Being the hoarding-inclined sort of mammal that we humans tend to be, it's no wonder that this appeals to, well, pretty much all of us. And for the same sort of reason, we're now also living out much more of our lives in the digital domain. We connect with friends and family through social media and messaging apps. We flirt and find love, or at least try our best to, in dating apps. We plan and track our health and exercise in fitness apps. We park our cars and do our work and meet our doctor and hunt for new jobs and new houses and book our laundry times, watch our series and control our lights and answer the front door and pay our bills and order food and on and on it goes, all from the comfort of the little supercomputers we carry around in our pockets. And all this obviously makes us much more individually vulnerable in all sorts of unsavory ways. I mentioned revenge porn in the previous video, but let's take a slightly closer look at an even newer development that illustrates this issue quite well deepfakes. Now, deepfakes refer to AI-generated photos or videos that convincingly superimpose a person's face or voice or similar onto somebody else. While the technology was originally a bit clunky, it's quickly developed to the point that anybody with minimal computer savvy can today download software to create reasonably convincing and realistic deepfakes. This has been discussed somewhat in relation to politically relevant material, such as the possibility of manufacturing fake scandalous footage, but the realm that's seen by far the most active use is deepfake pornography. This began with putting female celebrities' faces onto pornographic actresses' bodies, but has quickly become ubiquitous also as a form of manufactured revenge porn, not only by exes but by any person looking to harm someone else for whatever reason. So, where revenge porn usually arises from situations where people have trusted their partners only to be betrayed by them after breaking up, deepfakes can come from anywhere. For example, there are today a number of apps that will realistically undress or nudify a person in a photo. Although, not just any person, since many of the apps only work on women in photos. Likewise, it's generally considered sufficient with a few seconds of reasonably high-quality video and audio of an individual in order to create non-consensual deepfake pornography of them. As you can probably appreciate, this introduces an entirely new level of privacy concerns compared to revenge porn based on real but private footage. For example, traditional revenge porn often leaves the victim feeling both isolated and unable to rebuild their lives, and this happens largely because much of the public, like some of the legal attitudes we discussed in the previous video, tend to unfairly blame the victim for creating the content in the first place, rather than holding the perpetrator accountable. But with deepfakes, there is no such original content, no questionable choices about whether or not you really should have sent that nude selfie. Instead, a few perfectly innocent photos, or a social media post with video from a public awards ceremony or a competition or whatever, or possibly even a secretly screen-recorded Zoom or Teams meeting, can be enough. In effect, Deepfakes fall quite conveniently within Prosser's legal notion of appropriation, that is, using someone's likeness for something they haven't approved of or consented to, except that the state of the technology allows anybody with a computer to do it more realistically than even professionals were likely to have been able to up until very recently. And given the pervasive nature of it, we're no longer talking about your face being slapped on an ad campaign for a product you hate. We're talking about, for the most part, sweaty men exchanging fake but realistic pornography of you in dark and dank corners of the internet with no real control or oversight, and so no real opportunity to put a stop to it once the deepfake has been published online. So, in other words, the moral stakes here are enormous. And make no mistake, just like with traditional revenge porn, the personal impact of deepfakes can be truly devastating, not only because of the public humiliation, but because the process of generating deepfake pornography completely ignores a person's right to choose for themselves in an abuse of power that's very similar to domestic violence. And not surprisingly, the emotional toll for the victim is therefore also quite similar, often encompassing depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, or sadly, sometimes even suicide.
I should note that deepfake pornography is not the only problem here. For example, there have been a number of incidences, particularly in the USA, of parents receiving phone calls only to hear their children screaming in the background and a kidnapper telling them to deposit some large sum of money according to some instructions within a short time span or else their child will be killed. In reality, however, the screaming child is a deepfaked audio recording that's been built by scraping the child's voice from some social media post. The scammers assume, and often rightly so, that at least some of the victims that they call will become so paralyzed with fear and anxiety that they comply with the kidnapping instructions before even realizing that their child is perfectly safe and sound. Now, if we zoom out from the specific phenomenon of deepfakes, why does the digital realm entail so many more risks today? Well, of course, part of the reason is the pervasive and expanding digitalization of our lives and societies, exponentially increasing the so-called attack surface for malicious actors. As already noted, we do so much more through our phones today compared to even the quite recent past, and this brings with it a number of vulnerabilities. But why is this? Why doesn't digitalization just mean that we replace some physical vulnerabilities with other digital vulnerabilities, but in what would effectively be a one-to-one -one trade. That is, why does it seem to be getting so much worse? Well, there are several reasons for this, but the one I want to focus on first is the notion of cognitive bandwidth. Basically, this is the idea that the human brain is only capable of dealing with so much information, and if you give it more, then it simply won't be able to handle it at all, in any appropriate or meaningful way. Kind of like how you'll have serious trouble paying attention to what I'm saying here if you're also trying to count backwards in your head from 200 in steps of 17 at the same time. Now, cognitive bandwidth has a lot to do with how digital technology can undermine our autonomy, which we'll discuss in later videos, but it's also highly relevant in relation to information security and the digital realm in general. Because basically, going about our business digitally requires a lot more of our brains than the way we used to do things in several different ways. So, for example, compare physical keys and digital passwords. Both give us access to areas that others shouldn't be able to get into. But my keys, I only need to remember where I put them and remember to bring them with me, and then I'll be fine. The passwords, well, they're a lot more complicated. In fact, let's rehearse some traditional security recommendations for personal passwords. One, don't use an easily predictable password like password or hello or 12345 or similar. Two, use a long password consisting of lots of different words or letters and numbers and symbols or similar. Three, use a different password for every site or app or function that requires one. Four, don't ever tell anybody else what your passwords are and don't write them down anywhere that others might see. Five, change all your passwords frequently, and so on. Oh, and if we're talking about any piece of hardware with a password like a modem or TV or robot vacuum or internet controlled dishwasher or whatever else you might have around, then make absolutely sure to change the default password from admin or default or change me or whatever else it might be. Now, how many of you follow all these rules with all your passwords. Nobody? No, I didn't think so. Even if we follow all the other rules, the combination of both having unique passwords for every site and app and so on, and changing them all frequently can, put together, be enormously mentally taxing and time-consuming. Not least given how many passwords the average person tends to need nowadays. So we fudge. We take shortcuts. We assume the bad stuff won't happen to us. And then, when it does, we're stuck with a situation that victims of identity theft and revenge porn and doxing and so on describe as absolutely horrifying. Things like being unable to pay your bills, losing your job or house, losing your ability to trust other people, including close friends and family, and so on. In fact, it's not uncommon for victims of these sorts of crimes to socially isolate for years as a way of trying to cope with the trauma of the experience. And cognitive bandwidth relates to deepfakes as well, although in a different way. Since deepfakes are created from photos and videos of us that are usually posted publicly online, the issue isn't so much remembering to create safe and reasonably unbreakable passwords. No, the issue here is instead that technology has developed so incredibly quickly that it's been essentially impossible for anybody to predict what sorts of risks we're actually taking when we put innocent photos and videos online. Oh, and as just a little side note, anytime somebody tells you that nobody needs privacy protections unless they have something to hide, just think of deepfakes and the way that they use completely innocent information to create a false version of you online that is likely to haunt you for years. Imagine if every time you're on your way to a job interview or a first date or similar, you know that the person Googling your name will find what looks like real pornography of you freely available on the internet. So yeah, in various ways, the limits of the human brain contribute to our increased vulnerability the more we go digital.
An entirely separate reason why the digital domain is growing increasingly risky is, like in the phone snatching example, because of organized crime. You see, a traditional organized crime syndicate needs to engage in a number of quite physical and risky practices, like dealing drugs or roughing up people who don't repay their illegal loans or human trafficking. These all generally entail meeting with people who can both identify you to the police and who might try to shoot you in the face or whatever. But in the digital domain, there's just as much, if not more, money to be made, yet with very few of the attendant risks. You don't need to go to the hassle of actually kidnapping a child when you can convince parents that you've done it by deepfaking the child's voice in a phone call. And digital criminals are much less likely to get caught than traditional criminals, partly because law enforcement doesn't usually have the resources to sift through the mind-boggling amount of information that makes up the internet in any meaningful way, but also because they'll typically coordinate and launch their attacks from another country with different or perhaps even practically non-existent legislation. So because of all this, organized crime has to quite a large extent gone digital. This means that the scope and scale of crimes like identity theft and deepfake kidnapping schemes are going from isolated incidents to more general pervasive societal risks that can happen to essentially anybody. And even more depressing than this is the fact that the way the digital domain is structured facilitates doing this sort of thing at a truly unprecedented and completely automated scale, as we'll see next. The second level of privacy-related information security that we'll discuss here today focuses on organizations. You see, never before in history have we all voluntarily and, to be fair, perhaps somewhat unwittingly, given away so much personal information to so many different companies. From the companies that make our phones and tablets and smartwatches, through all the various software and app vendors, to the numerous membership discount cards and subscriptions we take out. We feed them all with both explicitly entered information, like our names and addresses, but also an endless stream of implicit taps and clicks and hovering pauses over some TikTok videos instead of others, and so on. And they hoover it all up in order to effectively monetize our information. Now, to be fair, digital criminals don't generally care about which type of funny cat meme videos you like the most. No, they're more interested in the basic things like your name, national identity or national security number, credit card number, and a few other juicy pieces of information like that. And who collects that information? Well, almost any company or store you've ever bought anything from. Why do the criminals want it? Well, it's pretty obvious. In the interest of making online interactions as quick and simple and effective and painless and convenient as possible, we don't tend to burden the consumer system with too many checks and security safeguards. Name, a few numbers, maybe some proof that you're really who you say you are, like a bill or some form of ID or similar, and you're good to go. But then, of course, the same goes for the criminals. They also just need a name, a few numbers, and some flimsy proof that they are you, and they're good to go as well, only this time at your expense. And although they can, and as we already discussed, sometimes do target individuals to get this information, there exists a much more lucrative approach. After all, there are literally thousands upon thousands of companies, each one with thousands upon thousands of customers, whose personal information they all store in some nice, big, juicy database. So if you're a criminal, then it's much more convenient to get, oh, let's say 10 million people's personal information all in one go compared to trying to steal personal information individually from 10 million different people. So this is, by and large, why we get data breaches. Ever since 2005 was dubbed the year of the data breach by InfoWorld, I, I mean, ever since 2006 was dubbed the year of the data breach by BusinessWire, sorry, I mean, ever since 2007 was dubbed the year of the data breach by the Canadian Federal Privacy Commissioner, sorry, I mean, or, well, actually, come to think of it, every single year since 2005 has been called the year of the data breach by some media outlet or government office. Why? Wasn't it bad enough in 2005 when the credit card data of more than 40 million people was exposed in a hack at Card System Solutions, which served both Visa and MasterCard? <laughs> you have no idea how good we had it back then. As this infographic from the brilliant website Information is Beautiful clearly shows, since 2005, the number of data breaches as well as the number of individuals whose personal information was exposed as a result of these data breaches, represented by the size of the circles, has grown to truly staggering proportions. And unfortunately for us and everybody else, it shows no sign of slowing down anytime soon. You thought the 40 million people affected by the card system solutions hack sounded bad? How about the 500 million people from 106 different countries around the world whose personal information was scraped from Facebook in 2019 and posted freely online in 2021? 
I mean, statistically, chances are pretty high that the majority of you watching this video right now had your personal information exposed in that very data breach, at least assuming you've ever used Facebook. Now, I've put two links in the description below related to this. The first is a link to the Information is Beautiful infographic itself, so you can go explore it in all its glory. And you should. It's amazing. In addition, in case you're now feeling a little paranoid, I've also put a link to the website haveibeenpwned.com, where you can see whether your email or phone number has shown up in any of the biggest data breaches so far, just in case you're now feeling, well, a little paranoid. So, data breaches. They happen. A lot. And more, and bigger, with each year. This then leads to an interesting follow-up question. Why are there more, and why are they bigger each year? And relatedly, why isn't more done about it? Okay, let's start at the beginning. Why are there more data breaches each year, and why are they bigger than they used to be? Well, if we answer the last question first, why data breaches are bigger than they used to be, then the answer is pretty straightforward. Because companies are storing and processing more personal information than they used to. Why? Well, as we already discussed a few minutes ago, because personal information is lucrative, so the more of it you have, the more you can do with it. All right, sure, that explains why the data breaches are bigger, but it doesn't explain why there are more of them each year, so what gives there? Well, here the answer is, unfortunately, also quite straightforward. Why more each year? Because, as we already noted, organized crime is increasingly going digital, and developing the tools and skills to do so more efficiently. So basically, from a digital criminal's perspective, it's not just that the cookie jars are way bigger than they used to be, it's also that they now have ropes and ladders and cranes and all sorts of fancy tools to make stealing the cookies that much easier. And then, on top of all this, it's back to our old friend, cognitive bandwidth. Now, it might surprise you to hear this, but as it turns out, people who work in big companies are, well, also people. And so they also have, well, the same sort of cognitive bandwidth as the rest of us. So, as it turns out, most of the data breaches that have occurred over the years are because of this precise issue. So a company can invest millions in information security, hiring a whole team of security experts, locking its systems down, using military-grade encryption, and basically ticking every single security box. But then a third-party subcontractor who needs temporary access to the system in order to install some piece of hardware plugs in his own laptop, which is of course teeming with viruses after he clicked the phishing link promising to show him how to get rich quickly. And perhaps the company is lucky. Perhaps the viruses are contained at first because of the way their systems are locked down, but then, oh no, wouldn't you know it. They forgot to tell the maintenance guy, let's call him Fred, they forgot to tell Fred over at server farm number 86 that he needs to remember to change the default hardware password from admin to something better. So the hackers managed to install a backdoor, and it's already game over. Oh, and if you think the solution to this is that we just need more and better security, well, again, I'll point you to the infographic from Information is Beautiful. Most companies take information security extremely seriously, but they still consist of people, and at the end of the day, people tend to be, well, kind of dumb, at least in the sense of not being able to remember and handle digital systems as if they were walking databases. But what about the law, you say? Can't the law be used to provide incentives for companies to avoid data breaches, like punishing them severely with a huge fine if they suffer a data breach? Unfortunately, that kind of summarizes the approach we already have today. Companies suffer data breaches, and they get fined for it. That's how the law works in the U.S., that's how it works in the EU through the GDPR, that's how it tends to work in any country with a highly developed digital infrastructure. We'll discuss more about the GDPR in the next video, but for now, we can simply note that leveraging fines for breaches obviously isn't working. Part of the problem here is that companies need to remain user-friendly and accessible. If a company has such severe security measures that it takes hours just to set up a basic account, then even if this is done in the interest of security, most users just won't be interested. To your average consumer, promises of near-complete security will never outweigh extremely laborious setup or login processes. It doesn't matter if the company is offering four-factor authentication with two separate biometric measures of your choice, if it means you have to type in your password, provide your fingerprint, scan your iris, and provide a text message code each time you want to use their stupid app. And not only that, many people would be wary of providing their fingerprints and iris scans to a company they don't already know and trust to quite a high degree. After all, what's to say that the company doesn't suffer some data breach because of FRED or some similar issue? Now, not only has your password been leaked online, but your fingerprint and iris scan as well. Ouch.
Another problem lies in the fact that, much like with deepfakes, the advent of generative AI has lowered the threshold for would-be hackers to create mayhem. A short visit to the dark web will reveal chatbots like Evil GPT and Worm GPT that are specialized for and trained on worms and viruses and trojans and ransomware and so on and so forth. In other words, they provide script kitties and other relatively noob users to probe vulnerabilities and create unique attacks and exploits for a specified target organization without the need for any coding expertise or perhaps even a full understanding of what's going on. The fact that both companies and various public organizations, such as hospitals and universities and so on, have seen a vastly increasing number of cyber attacks in the last few years stands a good chance of being swamped by what may come next. We're now at a point in time where a few thousand cyber attacks a year might soon be seen as the good old days when the internet was reasonably safe and secure. Now, as if all this wasn't bad enough, with the various problems we face at the levels of both individuals and organizations, we have even more pervasive threats at the very highest levels of the internet as a whole. So, for our third and final level of privacy-related information security, let's move up once again. You see, while it may be obvious that individuals can make mistakes and be taken advantage of, or that companies can make mistakes and be victims of serious hacks, what can we say about larger structures, like entire societies? Well, unfortunately, there's plenty of ways that things can and do go wrong with privacy-related information security, even at this highest of levels. So, for instance, when nation-states start sponsoring dedicated cyber espionage groups, or when there are internet blackouts or shutdowns, or when anything else threatens the very fabric of the internet, through which most personal information in this day and age gets collected and processed and used and shared and disseminated, well, then there can be real trouble. Let's briefly discuss each of these in turn, using some noteworthy examples. First, in 2015, the U.S. Office of Personnel Management, or OPM, experienced a massive breach resulting from an attack by what seems to have been Chinese state-sponsored hackers. The breach compromised the personal information of over 22 million individuals, including not only employees of the federal government, but also several people who had been subjected to background checks, as well as their families and friends. The breach included extensive personal information, such as social security numbers, psychological information, personal military records, personal employment records, and the fingerprints of at least 5.5 million individuals. What makes this far more problematic than most attacks against organizations is that the impact went far beyond the normal outcome of a breach, that is, exposing individuals to the risk of identity theft. This would have been bad enough, but the OPM hack also enabled foreign actors to build detailed profiles of U.S. government personnel, which could then be used as an effective platform for blackmail, recruitment of spies and moles, and other similarly nefarious activities. In other words, the impact of this particular breach of private information went well beyond the already very serious potential impact on individuals that we normally see. And in this sense, the breach illustrated how personal information can, in some context, have a potential impact on a country's entire national security being actively weaponized against it. And it's not just China. No, the more that all kinds of different nations on all sides engage in this sort of mutual adversarial cyber espionage, the more the internet comes to carry within itself a sort of implicit threat to people's privacy inherent in its very existence due to the mountains of personal information available within it. Second, and related to this last point, is the fact that as we grow increasingly dependent on various internet services to function, so do we also grow increasingly vulnerable when our access to these services is suddenly limited or interrupted. In many countries in the world, authoritarian leaders will purposely use internet blackouts or shutdowns to control the population. So, for example, ever since its military coup in 2021, Myanmar's ruling junta has imposed repeated and ongoing internet restrictions to stifle dissent, starting with online curfews that have grown to near-complete blackouts in many regions. By cutting off access to the internet, the government has not only prevented the spread of real-time updates about protests and military crackdowns as it intended, but has also prohibited critical internet-reliant services like banking, healthcare communication, and online education. For many Burmese, this has translated directly into both financial struggles as well as a growing sense of isolation, and some estimates argue that the country has lost millions in GDP as a direct result of these restrictions. 
But even more important for our focus is the impact of the shutdowns on individuals' privacy. You see, the restrictions have often been coupled with heightened surveillance efforts targeting activists and other political opponents. But without access to secure anonymity-preserving tools or communication platforms, many people have found themselves unable to protect their identities or communicate safely. This has contributed to an environment of fear and vulnerability. Put simply, in some contexts, maintaining privacy can be a literal matter of life or death. Again, as we grow increasingly reliant on the internet in our daily lives, any potential interruptions in our access to it will entail all sorts of privacy-related risks and threats, including of the most serious kind. Finally, and relatedly, it's worth noting that even without authoritarian shutdowns, the internet as a technological phenomenon is incredibly complex. For one, the physical architecture that it's based on, the various cables and towers and modems, the servers and computers, the smartphones and devices, this is all almost incomprehensibly complicated. And on top of all this, the different software implementations on which the internet depends, the operating systems and programs, the protocols and security certificates, the interfaces and apps, together constitute such a vast digital ecosystem that it's not only dizzyingly sophisticated in its technical implementation, but also in its explicit and implicit governance structures and rules, as distributed across various countries, national and international organizations, and large and small companies. It should, by now, come as no surprise that this organic, constantly evolving system therefore brings with it numerous problems and risks, since the system's inherent complexity increases the challenges associated with privacy-related information security. In fact, even cybersecurity professionals equipped with advanced knowledge and tools struggle to keep up with the dynamic threats and exploits that emerge over time. Even here, then, a version of the cognitive bandwidth problem pops up again, at least in the sense that no human brain or even collection of human brains can fully grasp or monitor the full-scale and vast operation of the Internet. And this limited capacity is, of course, exactly what attackers exploit, creating incredibly sophisticated and automated attacks. Therefore, as systems grow increasingly interconnected, vulnerabilities in one domain can cascade unpredictably across the network. In other words, the sheer complexity of the Internet entails certain inherent system vulnerabilities that can quickly and easily transform into concrete threats to people's personal information. All right, so what can we do about all this? Well, if cognitive bandwidth limits everybody's ability to stay safe in the digital environment, including not only ourselves, but also the professionals working for the big companies that do all the collection and storage and processing of millions of individuals' personal information, and even in our capacity to understand the very nature of the internet as a gigantic global network, then what can we do to improve the situation? Or, in other words, how can we be a bit better about protecting privacy while keeping in mind our natural human limitations and the restrictions they put on any information security solution in the real world? That is exactly what we'll discuss in the next video. I'll see you there.